Hey, I want to also offer my welcome to all of you, uh, especially those of you who are guests. I've already met, already met first time guests who are with us, and we welcome everyone uh, on behalf of our church family, everybody who's sitting around you in the chapel or here in the great hall, or you're watching online. We welcome you. We're so glad that you're here today. You came upon a second week of a series of messages that we've called clearly uh, in his image. We're talking about what it is to be kind of holistic, uh, integrated people who worship God with everything we've got. That's what we've been doing this morning, singing about it even. And today we have a special guest again. What we're doing each week is uh, a, a brief, a shorter sermon from me and then uh, talking with someone about how we can apply the text that we're looking at, the focus of the day. Today we're going to talk about physical health and how it comes into play with holistic health. I think you'll be maybe surprised and encouraged by how this conversation goes. Last week we set the groundwork. You can turn to Genesis 1 if you want to do that real quick. Uh, we're going to look at just one verse there and then it's going to springboard us into another passage that will be our focus today. But in Genesis chapter 1, it says that we've been created in, in his image. Now, last week, Dr. Katie McCoy uh, talked to us about what this means. And we talked about it on Wednesday night. Every Wednesday night, following each of these sermons, uh, our guest is going to come back and we're having uh, a continuing the conversation. We're going to do that again this week uh, from 6 to 7 in the Great Hall. Come and join us. We had a great time last week where you can bring your questions and talk further, dive deeper into uh, the topic. And uh, so today, uh, we're going to set the groundwork again. Foundationally, we said that in Genesis 1, 27 is where you can uh, look at this verse that stands out and serves as a foundational verse. So God created mankind. Some have noted this is really the first poetic uh, uh, or poem, if you will, poetic statement in the Bible. So God created mankind in his own image. You can see this. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. We live in a culture where the question uh, is legitimate. What does it mean to be human? And how about this? We're seeing it on the world stage yet again. What does it mean to be male or female? We're going to talk about that next week as we talk about biblical sexuality with Dr. Katie McCoy. But we are um, going to look today about what it is. We said that this means we're created, right? Huge implications. There is a creator and we've been created for a purpose. We are we're co-creators with him, we said. We are creators as well. And we are communal. We live in community. There's this idea of shared experience. We are, how about this, embodied people, right? And so what does it mean to worship God in in our bodies? It's a basic question. I want to lay it out this way today. Um, we are integrated, okay, holistic and embodied humans. Uh, this is so important, particularly in our day where we're seeing a new Gnosticism. Uh, we talked about this last week that separates like the soul and the body or in our day, the mind, my desires are telling me this, my body might be telling me something else. We all experience that uh, of desires that go awry. And it really comes from way back in our ancient Greek history, Western thought influenced by Plato, 4 BC, uh, Aristotle and others that, who, who really, there's this dualistic approach. There's spirit, there's soul, all those things. And then there's the body. What we're going to see today, the Hebraic mind says, no, 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 no. That's not what we see in scripture at all. In fact, a place that we can go to see Jesus talk about holistic worship is uh, Mark chapter 12. So turn in your Bible to Mark 12. We're going to leap uh, to the New Testament where Jesus, right, the definitive one, perfect theology embodied, the perfect human, tells us what's up. Now, this story is found in the synoptic gospels. You might know that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. All, all of them share this same story where uh, a group of experts in the law were talking with him. And in Mark 12, 28, it says this. You can see it in your Bible there. One of the teachers of the law, okay, an expert of the, of the Jewish law, came and heard them debating. So he heard them going back and forth. And then watch this. It's almost comical along the way. Noticing that Jesus had been giving him a good answer. You know, like, that guy knows what he's talking about. Little did he know, right? He asked him, hey, of all the commandments, which one's the most important? Um, uh, the language is such that it seems they're trying to put him in a corner of the, you know, 613, 15 uh, laws in, in the Torah. The most important one, Jesus says, 
masterful. He brings it down to the one is this. Hear, O Israel. You might know this is the Shema. The Shema is the, for us Christians, it's the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. It is the statement of faith for Jewish people. Still, Orthodox Jews and Jews all over the world pray this prayer in the morning and in the evening. Every single day, they're proclaiming the basis of, of, the, of, of truth, and we can do the same. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. It starts with the Lord. He is one God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And then he says, the second is like it, uh, which is to say, it's tied to it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. The same guy says then to Jesus, hey, you answered that right. <laughs> you know, can you imagine? Hey, that was a good word. Um, and then Jesus says, hey, you know, you do this, you're really close to the kingdom. What he meant was, and love does. I think it was Bob Goff who wrote a book called Love Does. Love um, is, is, is action. And the word Shema at its core means here. It's the first word, hear and obey. It's called the Shema. And, and the word is connected in Hebrew. It's the same word. And so here it again. This Western thought is, I can agree with something, totally understand that, completely get it. I'm all for that. And it doesn't change my life at all. I don't practice what I say I believe. In the Hebraic mind, that would never happen. We would say it to our kids, right? I mean, there's a sense of listening. Like, you didn't hear a word I said. Your bed, your bed's not made up, you know, or whatever the thing. Um, and we, we do the same thing. But Jesus effectively drops a mic and says, this is at the heart of it, Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. Now, that may not have been a real surprising answer, but what he's doing here is saying we are to, and you got a sense of this, right? We're to worship God comprehensively holistically with everything we've got. So what I want to do here is take a deep dive into what each of these words mean. And, and I'm fascinated. I don't have time to dive into all this, but I learned some things that preached this, taught it, but we think, well, these are different aspects of a person's life. And yes, but all of them have a holistic sense of the single person. Some of these words we, we've got wrong in the way that we approach them. So first, the heart, okay? We are to love him. If we take a deep dive into the original language here, the, the Hebrew word is lev, okay? The Greek is uh, cardia. You catch the word? Cardio, right? We know this. The ancients, Hebrews, they knew there was an organ in the chest called the heart. They do the same that we do, right? We know that I love you with all my heart, right? You're not talking about the heart. You're talking about all of your being. So, so here it is. What it means here is that it's the decision making. Uh, it's, it's where the will of the person is, is the heart. You know? And again, not the organ, but uh, we, 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 we talk about it that way too. In fact, the word, um, this phrase that I have a broken heart comes from ancient Hebrew. The heart is where the will is. It was really the thinking center. Uh, it's, so it's this holistic sense of the person. It's almost like he starts with that because we're talking about the whole person, not just one aspect, not emotion only, but the entire person. Everything flows from the heart. And so we worship God from the center or the source of our lives. That's what this is saying here. The next is soul. This one probably more than any of these other words we get wrong. Um, the word soul, uh, the word is nephesh in the Greek. Uh, it's suke. There's another word, psyche, we get our word. Um, in, it's from the Greek. But nephesh is 700 times in the Bible. It's used over and over again. But it doesn't mean what we think soul is that disembodied part of me. Like I have a body, but then there's the soul. They, they, would, have, they would have said, no, no, no. The, it's the whole human self. Okay, nephesh at its heart means, means throat, actually. So this sense of everything that comes out of me, comes into me, it's, it's me. Like, you know, uh, Psalm 42, verse 1. As the deer pants for the water, you know this verse? So my, what? Soul longs for you. There's that idea of throat as well. But all of my body, my whole desire is to worship you. And we see this throughout the psalm. So you worship God with your fully embodied entire being. Okay. Again, that's kind of what heart means. So you'll see how each of these. Now, the one that kind of stands out there is mind. But even there, the word lebo in the, in the Hebrew, dia noia in the Greek, which literally means through dia, through intellect, 
Through reason, I worship you. Through my mind, captivated by your truth, I worship you with my thoughts. But this, again, was very much tied into the whole person. Okay, so I I said earlier, even the heart, even the soul has a sense of thinking. So you worship God with every thought, guided by him and his truth is what this means. Now, we all know we need a renewal of the mind is what it talks about in the New Testament. All of these things, all of us needs to be redeemed if we're gonna truly worship him because we're fallen, broken creatures, right? First Peter says that we are to always be ready to give an answer. This is a reasoned, rational, intellectual um, uh, answer for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. So you worship God, here it is, with every thought, guided by him and his truth. We worship him with everything we have, not just emotional connection, but an intellectual connection. I saw the um, El Arroyo sign this week. Anybody follow this? Um, The marquee sign. And it said this, if ignorance is bliss, there ought to be a lot more happy people in in the world. Um, but, But we have joy. We are happy. We have joy because we have the mind of Christ. And we are thinkers. We need all how the world needs deeper, intellectual, thoughtful Christian people who understand how to think deeply about issues in the world. That's what we're seeking to do. And then finally, strength. This word uh, is the one that jumped out at me as really different. The word is me'od. Okay, everybody say me'od. Okay, this is a Hebrew word. The Greek word is iskus, um, which is strength or, or power, or might, absolute everything you got. The word ma'od is actually an adverb, which is really interesting. Um, it's used in an adverb in the Old Testament over and over again. It's used uh, like a whole bunch of times over and over again. And it's, it means very or much. It's like a superlative. Okay, so when God created the world on the seventh day, you know, he said it was good. On the seventh day, he said it was ma'od good. He is very good. When the spies came back from, um, yeah, from the promised land, they said the land is may owed, may owed good. You know, so this week you can, after lunch, like that was may owed, may owed lunch. Let's go. Um, and some of y'all, man, that date we've been on, she was may owed, may owed. Uh, so it's this, it's superlative. Like, uh, it, how about this? It's to worship God with all your effort in everything you do, every resource, every breath you have, everything you say. So you get a sense. All of this is comprehensive worship. I I could say it this way. With all your muchness, worship him with all your life. Okay? So two things. Integrated, holistic, embodied people. Uh, And how do we do this? This is key. By loving others. How do you love God? By loving others. So in 1 Corinthians 6, or do you not know? It says that your body, perhaps you've seen this, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The presence of God in you, within you, his spirit now in you, whom you have from God. You're not your own. You were bought with a price. The very blood of of Jesus, his body broken for you. So glorify God. Look at this. With your body. Meaning you are embodied everywhere you go. Everything you do. Worship him with everything you got. Okay, so how do we apply all this? And really what we're gonna land on here, how does my physical health play out holistically in my life and and impact my mental, emotional, spiritual health in the end? So today's guest uh, is a member of our church. Many of you know Dr. Tyler Cooper. He has been a dear friend. Stacy and I love him and Angie, their family. He is, you might guess, uh, an MD. I'm just going to introduce him real quick while he says, please hurry up. Um, But uh, he's an MPH. This is a Master of Public Health, which which he got from Harvard University, uh, the degree, and it served us well during the pandemic. You can imagine. It's basically epidemiology, uh, epidemiology, where he's he's helping us understand all these things. He helped a lot of people. He's the president and CEO of the Cooper Robics uh, Center and Clinic. Uh, That is, you might know, up on Preston Road, not too far away. He wrote a book, co-authored a book called uh, Start Strong, Finish Strong. And it's a lot of what he talks about. So he leads in his role. He serves as as, uh, overseeing a Cooper Aerobic 6 different companies. I mean, just world-changing stuff that we'll hear a little bit about today that his father uh, launched many years ago now. But he's all about, their whole mission is improving the quantity and the quality of 
of, of health in people's lives through preventive medicine primarily and healthy living. Um, I could go on and on. Uh, I went to Baylor universities for all you Baylor people out there. Uh, he was actually an all conference track and field uh, star and barely missed the Olympic trials, which is kind of cool. Um, but he, he can tell us a little bit more about his family and, and his life. So let's welcome uh, Dr. Tyler Cooper to the stage. Tyler, great to have you here, Thank man. You. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, we, man, our people, we just love you already, love your family. Tell us more. Tell us more about your, your sweet family and then, then just dive in. I think great minds think alike. We yeah, kind of yeah. have Twinkies up here today. We got it so. going. Yeah. That's exactly. Angie yeah. and Stace helped us out. Trying to be like morning. my pastor. So. <laughs> yeah, so grew up here in Dallas. Angie, my wife, and my three kids. And uh, we've been at this church since, there, uh, since 2000. Angie and I were married here and raised our kids here. But, uh, but going back, um, how all this got started with my dad is back in the 60s, my dad had a crazy idea that exercise was good for your health. And this, and, and this is why, I didn't know that, it was crazy. It was, yeah, it was outlandish. When he was in medical school, he, th- he was taught that your heart only has so many beats, and if you run through them quicker, you will die sooner. Wow. And so that's what he was actually taught in med school. And so he had moved over to NASA. He was actually one of the flight surgeons in charge of the men going to the moon back in the 70s, and, and the Apollo lunar mission. And they were like, well, how do you, how do you handle long-term exposure to zero gravity? And he, having been an athlete, thought that exercise was good for you to do that, right? And so, well, by any hypothesis, though, how do you, you have a hypothesis, and how do you manage it? So how do you measure fitness? Mm-hmm. And as you can see on this picture, is that's an old Air Force cadet back in the 60s, my father on the side there, and they were measuring VO2 exchange as a quantitative measure of fitness in order to eventually prove that exercise was good for you. Crazy stuff. Yeah, pretty yeah. nuts. But what's even funnier then is so he left the Air Force in 1970 and he came to Dallas with this concept to prove that exercise was good for you, started a preventive medicine clinic, which there was no such thing, started a fitness center, which there was no such so thing. There were no, for real, there were like no fitness centers. No, you had I mean, there's a YMCA. Right, you had a Y or a Gold's Gym, but the fitness centers, we know it didn't exist. So he came with these concepts that were just unheard of, unparalleled, which now are commonplace. But one of my favorite stories is in those early days, um, you know, there was articles in the New York Times that said my father father was going to kill more people than Hitler by promoting jogging. This is real stuff. This is real stuff. Yeah. But it just goes to the testament of faith because, and actually my favorite is the next slide, is this is my mom and my dad running on mm-hmm. the cover of a magazine. I don't know if you can see that. It says, is it exercise, is it exercise appropriate for a lady? And in the, in the magazine, it talks about should women sweat? Yeah. So, so in the subtitle, something like should, all this huffing and puffing yeah, or something. Is exactly. it good for women? Exactly. And yeah. I'll have you know, my mom in those days always worked out with her pantyhose on. So it was... Uh, Wait, what? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wow. So she was hey, we, always we'll a lady. We'll talk more about that Wednesday yeah, night if yeah, you want to come exactly. back. Exactly. Exactly. Hear more right. in depth. But it wasn't until 1989 with the research that we produced that we showed that exercise actually is good for your health. Hard to believe, no one until 89. But what was so interesting about it at that point, Jeff, was prior to that, we always thought that more was better. If you could walk a mile versus run three versus run a marathon, or the marathoner would have the best level of fitness. Mm-hmm. And in fact, what we found is that if you could just not be in that bottom category of fitness, essentially just not be just still, mm-hmm. but actually you know, walk a few times a week, you'd increase your lifespan by six years and decrease your risk of dying of any cause by 58%. But to go up from there, you only got a very little more benefit. Yeah. And, it, and it went on from there. We know we have studies now where we can, we're going to talk a lot more about this on Wednesday because I can geek out on the science, yeah, yeah. so I'll try not to bore Let's you guys today. Uh, but we know that cancer goes down, as you can see on the next slide. And, and for quality of life, if you look at this next slide, all these things on quality of life, fatigue, energy, all these things, depression, anxiety, all those things go down as you become more fit. Mm-hmm. So I think we look at the life of Christ. He walked a lot, right? There yeah. was a lot of walking Everywhere. in the life of Christ. Yeah. So um, why, well, you know, why does all this matter? Or, or keep yeah, pressing yeah. on? So, you know, it's not just about our personal health, but it's like our global health. And we think about how does exercise relate to our economy? We know that fitness right now is, or excuse me, that our medical system, the cost of healthcare is outrageous. And we know that fitness actually lowers the rate of healthcare costs. This is a study where we've lowered the rate of Medicare expense by half 
I mean, think about that. By a single thing of just not being sedentary, we can prove all this. And again, we'll lay it out in detail. But all that to say, so the summation point of all of that is that exercise is a vital sign of your health. That's how we practice medicine at the Cooper Clinic, is we measure your level of fitness as a means to then manage it and to improve both the quality and quantity of your life to come. Mm-hmm. So the key thing is that it's, it's grace-based, right? Yeah. You just start wherever you start. If you Good. can walk for 10 minutes, you start there. Yep. But you don't have to get that much more. The thing, uh, what, what is surprising to me, um, you know, I've talked a lot about this through the years, but you, you talk about, uh, it's kind of maybe it'll set a lot of people at ease. Doesn't take much, really, in the end. Doesn't really take doesn't. much. Do just, something. Just do something. Right. And again, wherever you are, just start. Yeah. That's good. the main thing. It just, just start. Whatever you can do, just uh-huh. start. And, and talk to us about, you, you talk about... What is it called? Lowering the curve? Or, yeah. Or? So our, like you mentioned, our goal is to help people uh, improve the quality and quantity of their life. But what's the goal of that? It's to live a long, healthy life. We're all going to die. But we want to be productive in those years. And we don't want to spend time in the last years in hospital right. visits and doctor visits as much as we can avoid that. So we call it squaring off the curve, the curve. which my parents who are 93 and 89 completely live on their own still. My dad's in the office every day. <laughs> you know, he reminds me he's in the office every day. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, but yeah, they've been married 65 yeah. years yeah. And, and they're our living example. But his parents died young, so it was the choices that he made that's given him that, that level of life. I want to hear more. Your dad's story is worth just telling if we took the whole time Wednesday night doing that. But I want to hear more about that Wednesday night. It's amazing. There's some yeah, really interesting incredible faith story. pieces there. So what do we do about, about all this? Okay, right. what, talk to us. Let's, let's start so, to apply. So again, I think you have to, first of all, just accept yourself wherever you are with your health. Uh, 80% of our country is overweight or obese, okay? So if you're in that category, which you know, a lot of people struggle with, that's okay. The goal is not to look like the Olympians that we've been watching mm. on TV. That's mm. not the goal. The goal is just to do something. And so we've come up with what we call the eight steps of getting Cooperized, which are eight simple steps of how you can manage your life in order to get the physical benefits that we talk about. And we'll go into a lot more of those on, on Wednesday night of the details of those. But it's generally like staying fit, realistic diet, realistic weight, knowing your numbers, uh-huh. managing uh, stress, those sorts of things. Excellent. Okay, so how then, let's, let's get to the heart of this, and I know your passion. How does faith and mental health, physical health, then all go together, right? Well, it's, it's two sides of the same coin. If I'm not physically well, I'm not going to be mentally well. Mm. And if I'm not mentally well, I'm not going to be physically well. And in our country right now, we have an absolute epidemic when it comes to anxiety and depression. As you can see here, we have 20% of our population that is being treated for either anxiety or depression. These are people who've come for help, not others. They've actually acknowledged. So, I mean, many of you in the room may have dealing with these things and you've never sought help, which if you haven't, I encourage you to. Mm. But why? If you look at the next slide, this has gone up dramatically uh, in the last several decades. And the way, the analogy that I use is that if I tell you, Jeff, all right, I want you to get down on the stage right here and I want you to do push-ups. You'd say, okay, great. How many do you want me to do? I'm like, no, no, no. I just want you to do push-ups. Well, you're Jeff, so you may be able to do 500. Um, <laughs> but eventually, your muscles are going to wear Atrophy, out, right? Just, They're gonna, yeah, you, you're physically, the lactic acid buildup, you will not be able to push yourself up. And, and that makes sense, right? But it's the same thing with our brains. You know, when I was growing up, when you were growing up, if you go in line and wait for coffee... You just wait. And you just sat there and you waited. Now... We might have even talked to people. Yeah, heaven wild. forbid, right? It was yeah, wild. Yeah, Crazy yeah. stuff. Have communication. Yeah, it was wild. But we don't rest our brains anymore. These devices in our pockets, they're great devices, but like any tool, they can, like a hammer, it can build a house or it can be used as a murder weapon. Mm-hmm. It's all in how you wield it. Yeah. And what we do is we spend way too much on time on screens. We don't rest our brains. We need rest. I mean, God... And the seventh day rested, right? right. He probably right. didn't need it for himself. He probably did it as a representation yeah. of how we are to live. Christ so in rested. the life of Jesus, right? right. He rested yeah. all the time. He saw, it. He, he saw it rest. But so the way that the body, I think, forces rest is by anxiety and depression. Like you're, you're pushing too hard. Mm-hmm. And the only way I'm going to get you to listen, it's like the lactic acid in the muscles, is you got to pull back. And so what we're trying to take people is how do you put rest into your daily life? If I said, if you can't go into the, to the, to the shop, wherever you're going, get a coffee or whatever it is, and you can't leave your phone in the car, mm-hmm. you already got a problem. Mm-hmm. There's yeah, a good so litmus you, test for So this has been helpful for me. We've talked about this as well. I, 
um, I'm, I'm often listening to things, always learning, always, you know, a podcast or listening to something. And I love worship music even, like if I'm working out or something. But you and I have talked about the fact, no, 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 no. All, okay, all that's good. But there's a time to shut it off, enter into silence. You've, you've entered into a practice. Um, I've sought to do this where you first, in your quiet time, even a moment, okay, let's get in the word. Let's do our dwell reading or let's, even let's pray. But really just to get centered and silent and quiet. I think a lot of us would struggle with, what am I doing now? Why am I, what, what's happening? We don't know what to do with science. Well, it's, it's biblical. It says, be still and know that I am uh, God. Yeah. And so my own personal practice, I start my morning in prayer and then I just sit there. It's good. I just sit quietly for 10 or 15 minutes with no objectives, no mission, just sit quiet. When I exercise, I don't have any entertainment. I just go exercise. Mm-hmm. I try, I, but you know, it used to be that wasn't an issue, Right. Right. It wasn't something I had to try to do. Right. I had natural silence in my life, but because of the high-speed nature of our life today, we're, just, yeah. we're wielding that tool in a way that's killing ourselves slowly, and we have to fight back. You have to step back. But again, it's all grace. It's like wherever you are, accept it. Mm-hmm. Work, with, work with our Father to help guide good. you in a way to it's good. move you in the right direction. That might, well, I pause here because that might be, we talk about this often, but that may be a major application for some to be yeah. convicted Just be still. and to change. Learn and, to be still. And, and, and all ages, really. Right. You know, um, so why don't we, let's get to the heart of it. Why don't we rest? Because if we don't know why we don't, then right. there's something up. So I'll use an analogy to show this next slide. I, I love to mountain climb, right? Mm-hmm. I love mountain climbing. So you've, you've climbed all 74 14ers, yeah. right? Yeah. Over 25, 25 years 25 years so. it took me. That was, uh, again, I'm an achiever mindset, so yeah. I have to have a goal. But okay, so no, wait. So has that become an idol for you? Uh, it right did, yeah. 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 Oh, for yes, real? It okay. did. So it was an idol. Hey, and I, but you sent me a text not when that last summer, you and Clark, yep. your son climbing Matterhorn. Yep. Okay, yeah. so you're, I mean, you're still out there. Oh, yeah. And I get it. Both of us are, are I call myself a Christ-centered naturalist, right? right? Like, I love to be outside. I love I to worship too. the Lord outside. So you're, so that's not everybody, but that's a thing for you. Oh, I love it. So what have you, yeah, what have well, you learned through all that? So when I finished climbing these mountains, I had a patient ask me one time, he's like, what'd you learn from climbing all these mountains? And you can see in this picture here, the summit is an incredible place. You put all this time, effort, preparation, courage, to get to this singular geographic location, sometimes not bigger than this table right here. Mm. And when you get there, all the endorphins release. You're like, oh, this is amazing. And I, all this effort and this great, incredible sense of accomplishment. But then after 15 minutes, you look around, you look at these pictures like, man, if I stay here, I'm going to die. <laughs> there's, I can't, there's no water, shelter, food. There's nothing. I will mm. literally die. I don't think anybody wants to live on one of those little pictures right, right. there. Right. There are places to be visited. And what I found is that through my patient care and working with people is that everybody has a mountaintop in their life that they're trying to achieve as if they can live there. And I call them the five P's of pride. Mm. Power, pleasure, profit, praise, and piety. That we think that, and I've seen it happen so many times, if I can just get to this place, then I'll be able to sit my chair back. It's a lazy boy. I can plant my flag, slap my hands. I want it life. Mm -hmm. And now I can rest. And it is a fallacy. It, It lasts, you know, some people that, They may get the endorphins of reaching that goal for 10 minutes, but then it starts wreaking this mental havoc because they, and and it happens in the faith, right? We think that we can, if I can just do enough for you, God, if I can just, man, if I'm just spend 10 more minutes or I can do whatever it is, then I'm going to be okay. And it's not because it's not, we're not meant to be okay here. Hmm. We're meant to be okay when we're with him. He's with us to keep us okay. But the objective is, it's not in this world. Yeah. And so quit working so hard to achieve something that's never going to sustain you in a way that's going to last. Wow, wow. So you, um, you've, we talked about this as well, the, the kind of the air we breathe, the air of even, even capitalism. Yeah. And it's achievement of more right. and more and more. Right. So it's, it's like, I like to say that so much has happened in our church today and in our, in our world, really, where we've laid capitalism on top of our faith. That more is... If, you know, however many people is here, well, I wish there were a thousand more. Mm-hmm. Does it really matter? Right. I mean, sure, if that's God's calling, but we always pray that God brings the people of his choosing, right? And so, but yet we have this mindset, if, the, if we're not growing, then we're not where God wants us to be. Mm-hmm. And I had a, a friend of mine, a professor at DTS, a guy named Ramesh Richard, who runs the Reach, mm-hmm. some of you may know. Yep. And he told me one time, he goes, you know what, you can ex- what an Iranian underground pastor can expect of a conversion in his career while living in mm-hmm. Iran? One life. He says, now tell me it's not worth it. That's God's economy. Right. 
not capitalistic economy, which I'm a capitalist, don't get me wrong. Measure, measuring but measure, numbers, it's, yeah. I want to be, it's like the parable of talents, right? I always love that because I'm an achiever. I was like, well, forget the tenfold. I'm going to do like a hundred. I mm-hmm. mean, let's bring it. If we're going to bring it, let's bring mm-hmm. it. Yeah. But you know who was trying to measure the return? Me. Uh-huh. Instead of saying God's economy, which I don't see is where I really need to put my faith. Like if I'm living the life, then that economy is going to be what it's supposed to be. Yeah, you've helped me. I remember some, it's been a few years ago now. Um, y'all, can, y'all can thank Tyler because he's kept your pastor healthy mentally and, and kept me focused. But we were talking over lunch one time about uh, kind of the wake analogy um, which, you know, we focus on the, the influence we're having. I'm prone to do this as a pastor. Like, man, how many people? How many? We need to save more. Surely we need to get a bigger church. All the things. Talk to us about, about the wake. Right. And this is something that, that, that God taught to me. And I don't know if we have the picture of the wake there. But mm-hmm. um, it was, I'm an achiever mindset. And I, you know, I grew up in, in a world where my dad achieved a lot. And he helped a lot of people. And my thought was that kind of that capitalistic idea of, of more is better, right? And then God obviously wants me to do more. Uh, but through my own trials and tribulations and the way he's taught me, that's not really the case. It's his economy. And so the analogy I use is like, imagine your life is like a boat and we're born on this shore. And when we're born, we're placed at the helm of our boat. We're at the wheel and we're all going to the other shore and you can only move forward because time never stands still, right? And the, and the other shore is, is, is death. Christ. Yeah, okay, well, it's death. death. But okay. when you become a Christian, ah. now you have a compass heading. Right, right. You have a that's setting. The focus. That's the focus. So as I head off across the water, Fix your eyes I'm on fixing my eyes him. on that. Okay. Well, right behind the boat, the wake is super tangible. All five senses, touch, smell, see, feel here. They can all experience it. You can experience the wake. But the experiential part of the wake is only about as wide as the boat. If I go two miles back, the wake's four mile wide, impacting everything that comes into its path, and yet I can't see it. Mm. And so what I say is, I, I went back, it's like, where do you see this in the Bible? And you look at the story of the widow and the widow's mite. You know, the, they come through and the rich guys give a lot. And the widow comes in, she gives her two mites. And, and then she moves on. And, and I look at, what did Jesus do? As far as we know, he tells his disciples, hey, this is how we're supposed to live sacrificially. But what did he not do that we know of? He didn't go rescue the widow. He didn't go give her a husband. He didn't go give her food. He didn't give her a hug. He didn't all her existence, as far as we know. Why? Because her compass was already on him. Mm. And so if, and that's if, the end game. That's the that's goal. That's the end game. So if he uh. had congratulated her or whatnot, all she's going to be doing is staring at the wake going, oh man, look at, right. God, you're kind of lucky to have me on your team, aren't uh-huh. you? So are we trying to stare at our wake of what we're doing for God or trusting that if we keep our eyes in all elements of our life focused on him, the yes. way we steward our body, the way we steward our mind, the way we steward our soul, if we're seeking towards him, then that wake is going to be whatever it's supposed to be Mm. not something that we want it to be. Because if we're following him, how could it be anything else? What a great word, y'all. Full stop. If the goal is him, you don't have to look back at the wake. You know, hey, wow, I'm do- look at me. Because the moment we look back, right. it becomes about us, right? And then we lose that, that focus and we lose the reward right. even there. Well, it's like even in like my business, you know, I have people, well, aren't you going to grow your business? I'm like, not if God doesn't want me to. Mm-hmm. the amount of people that I reach, and we get to reach a lot through our business and our work, but I'm going to trust that I'm reaching the people that God wanted me to reach because he doesn't need me. The creator of the universe doesn't need Tyler Cooper, right. but he wants me, and he wants me to be a steward mm. of what he gives me. It's like, it's like the farmer, right? That he gives you the land, he gives you the seed, but unless you work it, it doesn't produce fruit. Yeah. I mean, so, it doesn't produce. So it's what Paul said. He said, I work harder than anybody. Right. because of the grace of God extended exactly. to me. I want to worship him with everything I've got. But he had, it wasn't out of order. His, his love was not out of order. Exactly. His focus was on the Lord. And this is so important, gang. This, and, and my friendship with Tyler has taught me a lot about this as we've talked about it, is um, success is worshiping him with all I've got, like we're talking about today. Whatever comes as a result of that, that's the Lord's doing. That's not our doing. And that takes a lot of faith not to keep looking back. It takes a lot of selflessness and dying to self to not do right. that too. Because our culture tells us right. to measure how well we're doing. Yeah, wow. And that's only about pride, right? How freeing is that? It is. Though to just live in the moment, live in the present. Lord, I'm going to be, success for me today is to worship you with all I've got. So that's great. Hey, let's, uh, let's thank Tyler for being with us, all of you in the chapel and everybody here with us today.
Tyler, thank you so much for coming. We appreciate you. All right. I'm going to hand it over to the chapel here, but I want to offer this before we do. Um, this, this is a great word from God's word. It's 1 Thessalonians 5.23, and it says this. May God himself, the God of peace. Do you feel that a little bit today? Oh, a sense of release and some freedom. We hope so. The grace of God setting you free. It says, may the God of peace sanctify you, make you holy, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That blamelessness is because of Christ and his righteousness covering us. We're all guilty of sin. We all need redemption. And he alone has made a way for us, having lived the perfect life. Jesus worshiped the Father perfectly as an embodied human person. And then he was raised again, resurrected in bodily form, as we will be ultimately as well. So this, uh, this body is coming to an end. But he's making all things new. And it starts as we give our lives to him and worship him with everything we've got. So... I'm going to hand it back to our, our crew in the chapel. And here, we're going to worship the Lord together. Okay? So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to have uh, Han and the crew lead us as we just bring our hearts to him. Don't leave. Don't rush out. Just worship him with all you've got before we close. Okay? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time we've shared together. Thank you for Tyler. But thank you for your spirit that's spoken into our hearts today. It's what you do. So you're the same God who gave the, the Israelites uh, way back through the Torah in, in Deuteronomy. You gave the word that we're to love you comprehensively with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. You're the same God who sustains us today. You're the one who is calling us out by grace, not to put a, a heap of guilt or, or challenge on us today, but to say you're loved. You're the same God. So remind us now as we reflect on that, that you're the one who's brought us through the good and the bad and you're going to do it again. So we worship you now in Christ's name. Amen.